Welcome, everybody. How's it going? So, hello, my name is Austin Isaias. I go by he, him pronouns. I'm the uh, manager for student programs and engagement with ASI. Thank you. And we're really excited to have you all here for our final installment of the Beyond the Conversation speaker series with Michael Phelps. <clears throat> so I wanted to start off uh, by thanking the Division of Student Affairs for all the support with this wonderful series. Without them and their contribution tonight into all the series, we would not be able to have this program. So thank you very much. All right, so now let's get started with this program. So first, I'm gonna introduce Josh Mitchell. He's our student body president who will be introducing our student moderator and our guest speaker, Michael Phelps. So Titans, let's welcome Josh Mitchell. Hello, so now uh, for our student moderator. Jordan Murphy has been the student moderator this year for most of our Beyond the Conversation speaker series and has done an amazing job. And I know, she'll do, I know she'll do a great job tonight. She is passionate about the work surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion. Last year, she worked with the Diversity Initiatives and Resource Centers at CSUF to create programs highlighting the work. She's a communications major with an emphasis in advertising and will be graduating this spring. We are thankful for her stepping into this role and being so vital to the, to the success of the speaker series. Please welcome Jordan. And now, so for our next guest, distinguished guest, I must say, Michael Phelps sits at the top of the list when it comes to Olympic legends. Phelps has won a record 28 Olympic medals during his competitive swimming career. He also holds the record for the most gold medals, individual gold medals, and individual medals. Y'all, that's a lot of medals. <laughs> Phelps's effort at the 2008 Olympics in Beijing was particularly historic. He broke Mark Spitz mark by winning eight gold medals in a single Olympic Games. That effort earned Phelps Sports Illustrated's Sportsman of the Year Award. He had an incredible run that saw him become the most successful athlete at four straight Olympics. Phelps' first Olympic experience came in 2000 when he was only 15 years old. He was the youngest male to swim for TS Team USA at 68 years old. Phelps capped his career at the 2016 Olympic Games in Rio de Janeiro and served as the flag bearer for the U.S. at the opening ceremonies. Phelps promotes swimming and healthy lifestyles through the Michael Phelps Foundation. He is also a mental health advocate and has publicly spoken about his issues with ADHD and depression. Please join me in welcoming Michael Phelps to the stage. Ready for Michael Phelps? Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and get straight into this. So the first question I have for you is, can you tell us about yourself and how you're feeling today? I feel okay. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I mean, uh, yeah, I guess my name's Michael Phelps. Um, you heard a little bit about me. Uh, I have three kids, I'll tell you that. Um, yeah, that's it. It's kind of fun sitting up here and seeing, your, seeing all y'all's faces, to be honest. Um, it's been a while since I've really traveled. Um, I haven't done too much work over the last two years, so this has been pretty special to be able to, especially come out here and, and spend some time with you, you students today. So thank you. We're so glad to have you here. And I would love to just dive more into, I guess, some mental health related questions. And I just want to start with this one. Um, when you hear the words self-love, hmm. what does that mean to you? Uh, I can tell you I didn't have much self-love um, 
probably through most of my career. Um, I honestly, I, I looked as I looked at myself as an athlete and not a human being. So for me, it was a long journey trying to learn more and more about myself and accepting who I am, who looks back at me in the mirror. Uh, it took a long time, but it was honestly it was me going through some difficult times, me um, opening up about things that I've been holding on to for a long time. Um, and I, I feel like I now have self-love, but I feel like I'm still learning more about that. Um, you know, I think a lot of it comes with the self-care that you do, <laughs> that, that you do for yourself. Um, and it looks different for everybody. Um, for me, my self-care is if I don't sleep enough, don't want to be around, you don't want to be around me, period. <laughs> Uh, if I don't eat enough, no bueno. Um, and if I don't get a workout in, I'm not myself. I literally have worked out for almost 25 years of my life. Um, so before I got on a plane today, I live in Arizona, so I flew up this afternoon. I was in the gym after I took my two oldest sons to school um, because I needed to do that. In order for me to be the best dad, the best husband, the best friend, and the hardest worker, I have to, I have to take care of myself um, and know that that's not being selfish. You need to do that for yourself. You want to be your best you every day, your authentic self every single day. So you have to do that. Sorry, I could preach about that for a long time. <laughs> I'm curious. How are you able to define yourself outside of being the greatest swimmer of all time? I don't think I'm there yet. I think I'm still finding myself. Um, to be honest, you know, uh, I believe the second chapter of my life outside of the pool um, is going to be bigger than anything I've done in the pool. But, and I truly believe that. Um, all the world records, all the gold medals, everything else aside. Um, for me, having the opportunity to save a life or to help save a life, um, that's way better than ever winning an Olympic gold medal. Um, I, I know what it feels like to be in dark places and quite, frank, quite frankly, to not be alive. Like I've, I've gone through that. Um, and I, I wanna help anybody and everybody out there as much as I can to give them the support that they need to get through those times. Um, I know it's dark, I know it's scary, I know it's hard, um, but I also know it's possible to get through those times. I really want to talk about um, your documentary, The Weight of Gold. It really gives like a personal lens into an Olympic athlete's life. Yeah. Um, yeah. When working on that documentary, one. in what ways did you grow as a mental health advocate? Um, oh, gosh. I think it's just honestly, gosh, I don't even know. Um, I mean, I, I feel like I learn every single day. Um, look, I, I mean, as, as you heard me say, I, I just recently started liking who I saw in the mirror. Um, I can jokingly say I learned to communicate at the age of 30. So, you know, I've gone through some roller coasters and some ups and downs and maybe learned things a little later in life. Um, but I feel like for me, I'm okay being not okay. And I'm okay being who I am. And I think, you know, as long as I can just learn more about myself and, again, understand it's okay to not be okay. Because there are days where I wake up and I don't feel like me. I wanna climb into a hole. I wanna be left alone. But I also wanna get better. I also wanna ask for help. You know, for me, it's like, in my career, I always said, I never wanna have a day where I get 0% out of it. No matter how I feel, if I'm feeling like a million bucks, I can go out there and do absolutely anything I want. But it's that much harder when you feel like, I mean, you can't do anything. You don't want to get out of bed. But if you do that 10%, that 20%, that 30%, 50% out of that day, you're taking baby steps forward. And I know we've all heard this saying, Rome wasn't built in a day, but hey, it's true. Uh, there was no blueprint for me doing anything that I did. I had to learn. It was a baby step. It was a process. And during this, or, or when you first started this documentary, was it difficult to get athlete involvement with the topics that you were talking about? I was, I actually thought that I was going to have a lot of trouble. Um, but standing in the tunnel 
getting ready to walk out at Olympic, the Olympic Stadium for the 2016 Games as I'm carrying the flag for Team USA, and pardon my language, but I said, holy shit, I'm not alone. Because literally I could see how afraid people were just from looking at their faces. And right then and there, I knew I wasn't alone. So what could we do? I started asking people, friends, people that I knew who were struggling, they'd just open up and talk. And for those who have seen it, it's really raw and it's really in your face, but we got to have it that way. You know, we got to face these difficult topics, these tough decisions and these things that, that are uncomfortable. That's the only way we're going to grow. For me, my hardest thing was becoming vulnerable. That's a scary word. Oh, absolutely. I know I'm vulnerable here up on stage today. <laughs> so I definitely, I, I know that a lot of uh, students in the audience can relate to that too. So thank you. Um, the global pandemic has been extremely difficult on all of us, especially the students on campus. We've seen an increase of our counseling and psychological services being used. And quite frankly, this is the first week without a mask being mandated. And our campus is not fully returned yet. Um, was it difficult to maintain your mental health during these times? Uh, I'm used to being on the road and traveling, and I love my kids to death. I do. <laughs> I learned so much more patience or more about patience than I ever have in my entire life. Um, my, my boys like to compete with one another, shocker. But it's with everything. So it's screaming contest, how far they can throw something in the house. So it's just like, uh. so for me, again, having to be on the, or having, having, having to be forced to stay at home, to go out of my comfort zone, got really scary at times because of that unknown. I feel like loneliness struck up a lot more in people's lives than it ever has in the past. And loneliness is the one, well, loneliness helps lead you to depression. So, you know, I think for me, again, I joke about communicating, but if I don't feel good inside, or if my emotions are off, I talk about it or I write it down. I don't want to carry it on. Because if I can get it out into the open, I'm free of it right? You're able to move forward. I jump all over the place, and I'm really sorry. <laughs> I hope some of this makes sense. Oh, this makes sense. You're doing great. <laughs> um, in the 20, uh, in the 20, in, oh my gosh, in 2020, the Olympics were postponed. Did you work with athletes that may have struggled with all of the changes that were happening during the unprecedented times? I think the biggest thing that I talked with the athletes about during those times is trying to figure a way to control what you can control, right? So as a swimmer, I need to get in the swimming pool. I can't lose that touch, that feel of the pool. So how do I get, how do I find a pool? Where can I go? I need to lift weights, right? All these small things. I need to eat. I need to drink water. I need to sleep. Figuring out what you can control every single day because there's so much in a given day that is completely out of our control. Right, so I think it's just trying to focus on the small things. Um, you know, because at the end of the day, you're still trying to achieve that goal or that, that carrot at the end of the tunnel. Absolutely. Um, if the Michael Phelps now could talk to the younger version of yourself, <laughs> what words of advice would you give to him? It's hard. Um, I've gone through roller coasters, ups and downs, publicly, privately, anything you can imagine. I would tell him nothing. Because it has literally brought me to be the person who I am today. And again, I'm comfortable looking at myself in the mirror. Even if I have this dirty <laughs> facial hair. Like, my wife, my wife, she doesn't hate it, but like, she always gives me crap about it. But like, you know, just, just loving who you are, you know, like, I'm perfectly imperfect, right? Like, and that's just how I am. Like, I am how I am, and you know, small steps for me. I'm, I'm learning more and more about me and growing. And we all, we, we are who we are. We have to cherish who we are because we're all special in our own way. Doesn't matter anything. Doesn't matter who you are. 
We are all special in some way, shape, or form. And there's, there's a path for every single one of us. Every one of us. But I will say never give up on a dream or a goal that you have, no matter how hard it gets. I went five straight years without doing a single best time. 350 days in the pool at least, every day, all the time. 10 days a week, or 10 workouts a week. Like, five years straight without doing a best time? Like, I basically thought, why am I wasting my time? And then that next summer, the floodgates just opened up. World records, this, that, and the other. And then I was like, oh, it's easy, great. <laughs> this is what all the hard work was for, cool, now I get it. But that's, I mean, not every day is gonna be perfect. I think that's something you should remember. Um, again, back to those little things. Get that 10, 20, 50, whatever you can out of that day. Because um, time is such an important and valuable thing and something you can never get back. The one thing you can't ever get back. So we have a lot of student athletes in the crowd today. Do you all want to make yourself known? Do you want to say, hey, hi, a little round? Yeah. Oh, there we go. I was going to say, you guys are <laughs> quiet athletes. Come on now. Let's hear it. I would love for you to be able to give them some advice um, regarding balancing life, school, practicing, or any advice on how to protect their mental health. Um, keep it as simple as possible. Um, a routine is something that a lot of us know, right? If you step out of that routine, we know what happens. You kind of go down a spiral staircase. At least that's what I do. Um, so for me, routine is something that's so crucial. But listening to your body, listening to your emotions, um, your feelings, um, I, I think just, look, again, it's, it's kind of what I touched on before. Like, we're all going to hit rocks in the road, right? How do we get around those rocks? You know, I think the biggest thing is never giving up. So um, finding a way to get around the rock, over the rock, through the rock. Um, and again, remembering always to take care of yourself. Um, it's baby steps. Like, for me to be able to have the opportunity that I did, um, it was trial and, trial and error. It wasn't always perfect. I failed. I lost. I didn't hit my goals. But if it was easy, then wouldn't we all do it? We love hearing that, that saying too, right? I can't stand hearing that saying. But it's true. It, it really is true, right? Like, if it was simple, everyone would go out and do what I did. But it was something that I wanted to do. And again, there was no blueprint. It took me five years, almost six years, to really perfect swimming four to five individual events at the highest level of competition against the best in the world in their individual event. But I wanted to, so what the hell? Why not? Let's go. Give it a try, right? Like, what do I have to, like, I don't, I don't have anything to lose, and if I fail, get back up, right? Like, again, that goal for me of doing something that no one else has ever done before was exciting enough for nothing else to matter, right? Like, you know, as a kid growing up, did I feel like I was giving up? Like, as a kid growing up, did I feel like I wasn't that normal high school kid or whatever, that teenage boy? I, I didn't care because I had an opportunity that no one had. So, you know, for me, I, I was willing to do absolutely anything. Now, you've touched on it quite a bit, but I'd love to get into your professional life. Um, five Olympic appearances, yeah. 23 gold medals, 28 total Olympic medals, and 39 world records. <laughs> what does this, or what does this do to your psyche, and how? Have you had the time to reflect on these major accomplishments? I haven't. <laughs> um, and it's honestly because it's been from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next for 20 years. So, I mean, for me, I've kind of worked my way, I would say, through, let me say, I don't think I'm through 2012 yet of understanding everything. Um, and for me, 2012 was one of my most upsetting, disappointing Olympics. I mean, I, I felt like I failed, but I got the results that I deserved because I kind of played around and didn't really prepare myself. Um, so I got beat. And I went slower than I wanted to. 
but that was the motivation for me to get back. So I don't know. Can you? I always, um, leave, stuff out. I always leave stuff out too, and I never. I just lose train of thought. Sorry. No, no, you're good. We'll probably get to to a ton more um, today. What is the day in the life of Michael Phelps now compared to when you were competing? Um, I walk around a lot more. Um, I, literally, I, I used to swim and sleep. That was it. Like, I really didn't do much. Um, but I guess now uh, I'm in charge of a household. You know, I have three little kids. I have a wife. Um, it's different. You know, for me, in my career, in my past career, I was able to be as selfish as I could because I was trying to do something crazy and out of this world. But now, it's completely different. I cannot be that selfish human being. Um, you know, if my glass is half full, I can't provide for the rest of my family. So every day, it's what? I wake up at 5, 5.15, and it's earlier than I ever used to, work, uh, ever used to wake up when I was swimming. Um, just naturally wake up. Um, but I go to bed at 9 o'clock because the kids just sometimes... <laughs> The kids are sometimes in the room at 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock, and some of the parents out there I see shaking their heads. Um, but it's wild. You know, for me, I, I, I love the, the entertainment and the enjoyment that I have with my kids. You know, I, I never had a dad growing up. So for me, being able to spend the time with my kids over the last three years um, has been really special. So now uh, I'm in charge of, uh, I guess, meals, breakfast, and dinner. Um, I'm the chef in the house. Uh, I just got a sous chef back in the house, so I'm really excited about that. Allison Schmidt, um, fellow Olympian swimmer, um, she's like my little sister in the in the sport. She just recently moved back in with us, so she's my sous chef around the house, and it's incredible. Um, but other than that, honestly, it's just kind of playing with the boys. I work out, like I said, seven days a week, um, and everything that I'm doing work-wise. Uh, is around mental health. Um, because, I mean, let's be honest, my mental health isn't always great every day, um, which means probably the rest of the world isn't either. So what can I figure out and how can I help that? Um, you know, my agent and I are constantly trying to figure out, you know, things with technology that can help, different paths that can help, um, anything, honestly. Use, like, use your imagination. It's crazy to see what's out there and what's possibly hitting the market in a few years. Um, I'm super excited. And for me, like these are the things that, that I never thought I'd be able to do. Like, look, I, I had the greatest time in the world swimming and representing my country, and now I, now I just get to basically have fun and follow my passions, right? Like, yeah, mental health, that's literally, that's my passion every day. It's, it's what I love, what I, what I love, but also it's very hard at times. It challenges me at times, just like it did in, in, in the swimming pool. So for me, this is what keeps me up at night, and it's what gets me out of bed every single morning, even on those days where I don't want to get out of bed. Um, it's a nonstop job. Like it's, I'm, I'm always going. <laughs> it's really hard to relax. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would never change it, and I'm very lucky to, to be able to do what I do. Um, I don't know. I, mean, it's, I guess it's still nonstop. It's just out of the pool. I'm dry. <laughs> That's the easiest way to say it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now you've talked about today. Can you tell us about your swim journey? When did you first get in the water? How old were you when yeah. you won your first competition? Uh, I started swimming when I was seven. My mom put myself and my two older sisters into the sport for water safety, and that was it. Um, my two older sisters, uh, my oldest sister traveled around the country. My middle sister traveled all over the world. And I was like, oh, that sounds cool. I want to do that. And so sure enough, I started swimming. Um, I got with a coach who I spent 20 plus years with. Um, I guess at 11 years old, I kind of realized that, you know, maybe something special could happen if I kept doing all the work and the stars aligned. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know. I guess that's really it. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, my career, I mean, I, the, the 2004, for me, the 2000 Olympics, I was super disappointed. Uh, I came back with a piece of paper that said, you competed? <laughs> and I was like, gee, thanks. <laughs> like, what am I supposed to do with this? Uh, and I literally, I think I was three-tenths of a second out of a medal. Um, so for me, that gave me every ounce of motivation to really come back. Um, 
So I guess going into 2004, yeah, I mean, I started that journey the day after my final in 2000. And six months later, I broke my first world record. So it kind of just took off and it, was, it just went. And yeah, I mean, I can tell you everything. I can tell you every time and anything you want to know. Um, I'm so technical and, and when it comes to details, that's, that's, how I, that's how I lived. Well, I would love for you to talk more about your very early memories of being at the Olympics for the first time. Scared, really scared. Uh, I remember showing up for my Olympic final without my suit tied. I dove into the water with my suit untied. Uh, with my suit untied, um, they're really tight, so it wasn't going to come off. But still, um, it will cause some drag. But let's just say, I mean, as a 15-year-old boy, first time out of the country, first in international meet. I was a deer in headlights. I had no idea what to expect, no idea what was going to happen. So um, for me, I think I, I learned, or I used whatever happened at that, that 2000 Olympics as kind of like a, a crash course for 2004. And then 2004, everyone said I fell short of breaking Mart Spitz's record, but um, I mean, I won. So back then in 2004, Everyone made this story up of, of um, my, me versus Mark Spitz. The goal was never to be another Mark Spitz. I wanted to be the first Michael Phelps. So for me, when I got beat in the, thir in the 200 free, which was the second event, no, third event, uh, basically canceled any opportunities for me to win seven golds. So literally, if this was the press room after or before the 200 free, it would only be like that section the next day, like the far section. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Nobody cares. But the headline was, it was a failure. I, was, I, I failed. And I was like, oh, okay. I'll use that as motivation for the next one, right? And those lessons that I learned there will help me be even more prepared for the next time. So for me, I mean, you talk about, like, you can ask these basketball players who have won multiple championships. Each one is different. The preparation for each one is different. And in the moment, it's completely different because you're always changing. You're always growing up, right? You're always learning things along the way. Um, so for me, every Olympics was different. Um, if I had to pick one that was my favorite, I don't think I could um, just because I think it's hard for me not to say 2008 because you, you go perfect and you win a race by a hundredth of a second. Like, kind of have to say it. <laughs> um, like, you're just getting lucky. Some of it's luck, obviously, right? Being able to hit the touch pad. I mean, we won, or we, my coach and I won the 100 fly by a hundredth of a second, the four by one free relay by eight one hundredths of a second. Uh, I won the, what else was it? Um, yeah, okay, so other than that, we had to be perfect. Um, and then, yeah, 2012, we don't want to talk about. In 2016, um, for me, being able to finish on my terms, <clears throat> You know, after coming back in 2014, after I got my second DUI, um, I, I wanted to finish, like I, I, wanted, I wanted to look back 20 years from then and say there was nothing else, period. And in 16, I did that with my firstborn. And for me, that was one of my favorite moments being able to four-peat. Like, there are just too many amazing moments for me, but like those, the 2008 and 2016 Olympics were hands down my two favorite. Now, when you're standing at the starting block and the race is about to start, what are your final thoughts that go through your mind? Nothing. Because what can I change in that moment? Nothing. I can't think about my start, my turns, my stroke, because what I've done in practice is going to show at that moment. It's the most pressured, packed moment, period. If you haven't done the work, guess what? You're going to get exploited, <laughs> and it's going to show. Like it, and it, it stinks. Like in 2012, that's what happened with me. A few of my races I wasn't prepared for. I got beat. Now, you're a superstar athlete and there was tons of superstar athletes that would watch you compete, like LeBron James, Steph Curry, the late Kobe Bryant. 
Did any of that add more pressure to you no. as an athlete? No. Um, I mean, it's just awesome looking up in the stands and seeing them. You know, like after a race in 08, we literally see Kobe, Braun, the whole crew. You're like, oh, all right. This is kind of <laughs> kind of cool. Or like in Rio, like the whole team is basically in our team area after it was after my double night. I swam two fly, 200 fly, uh, four by two free relay. And that night they were they came down right after we got the medals and they were just hanging with us. We we're like, oh, cool, yeah, kind of sweet. But now it's like, like if I go to a game in Arizona, you just see them, and honestly, they're normal, right? I think that's that's the, that's the wildest thing for me. It's because it's like, you know, as a kid growing up, like I always thought Michael Jordan was this like unicorn, right? Like, but he's a human. The guy's a human. Like I remember when I first met him, I couldn't talk. Like I I couldn't say a word. Just jaw down to the ground. I was like, oh my god, yeah, I want to be like Mike, yeah. Um, <laughs> But then afterwards, I realized, I was like, it's just a normal person. I think that's the biggest thing. Like, if you can just say hello, right? Like, I think that, that's one thing. I, I, if somebody just says hi to me, I'm going to say hi back. You know, like, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Do you miss competing at the highest level? Yes. Um, but I don't want to do it anymore. Um, you know, and I think, you know, we saw what competing at the highest level for a long extended period of time does to you. I mean, look what Brady did. Brady was retired for two weeks. The guy literally lasted two weeks. Like, <laughs> I at least lasted two years. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, the competitiveness, like, that's what I love the most. I was the blood, there. I, I was the shark in the water that smelled blood. Like, there's anything there, you're done. Like, I will rip you to shreds. Like, I mean, you all saw the Phelps face. I'm literally just, like, like shooting laser beams through people. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it was really just, I didn't care what I had to do. Like, I, I was going to outwork every human on the planet um, because I know what losing feels like, and I don't want to lose anymore. So I just made sure that if I had a loss, there was always that. Like, that, it stayed with me. I, mean, I can tell you every, pretty much every loss I ever had, without a question. I, mean, I can tell you exactly what was going through my mind, too. <laughs> Actually, I probably shouldn't say some of the stuff here. I would love to transition into some questions that are asked by some students here. Uh, how did you balance the stress and pressure of the Olympics with your personal life? Didn't really have a personal life. I never really had a personal life. Like my, my personal life was what I wanted it to be, and and um, you know it was kind of just preparing for the next day. Like I was obsessing over the small things. Um, you know, in high school, I, I had a few friends, and those are my still friends today. You know, like so, um, yeah. <laughs> and, but I mean, like, sorry. And then I guess for me. Uh, I put more pressure on myself than anything else around me could. So I was just, I just made sure I was ready and prepared, right? Like, that's the one thing I talk about the most. If you're not prepared, sorry, good luck. Move over. Like, you have to be prepared for absolutely every little detail. And, and <clears throat> you know, for me, for me in my career, I, I basically, so, I'm going to talk about what we talked about back there. So a routine is something that is done for 30 days, right? If you can work on three to five things religiously for those 30 days, it becomes a habit. You don't have to think about it, right? Then you're able to take on three to five more things or 10 to 15 other things. And then before too long, you have a whole army. Literally, you're going to battle and you're like, oh, cool. What about that box? Oh, check, check, check. All your boxes are checked. Now you just get to be you and relax. And focus on whatever you got to focus on, whether it's swimming, whether it's competing, whether it's, I, I don't know, right? Like, that's the thing. You got to be prepared. You have to be. There are other people out there that are prepared, right? You know, I mean, for me, I was one of 52, one of 52 swimmers on the Olympic team. It wasn't me. There was somebody else there. The turnover is so fast. Now, um, 
You're definitely strong-willed, and we can all see that here today. And a student has asked, in your opinion, what is the value of hard work and a strong will? Hard work is everything. <laughs> Literally, I mean, it's, that's, that's, I mean, like, I, I, if you don't do the work, nothing's possible, period. Like, I, and, I mean, the hard work will give you confidence. It will, it, it'll, yeah, I mean, I think that's the easiest way of saying it. Like, you can't fake your way through anything. Sorry. I'll bust that bubble for you now. <laughs> easiest way to put it. What, um, what would you do during your free time besides training and swimming? Sleeping, eating, ice tubbing, stretching, um, playing video games. Um, that's about it. Yeah, that was literally favorite, it. favorite video games? Uh, in my, when, when I was swimming, we, we played a ton of COD. We played a ton of COD. <laughs> I mean, it was a, I wish I could go back and look at the stats, but... <laughs> I mean, we were, okay, so we'd go to Colorado Springs, where the Olympic Training Center is, and we would all bring our Xboxes. And I'm not kidding, we'd probably play like 2,500, um, uh, oh my God, I can't even remember what it was. Um, team Deathmatch? I don't even know what we were playing. We played like 2,500 matches over three weeks. Like literally nonstop. We were sl swimming, sleeping, video games, and eating. That's it for 26 days that we were there. It was awesome. I mean, we're, we're, we were basically in like a jail. I, 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 I would always compare it to a jail, the jail cell because there's a fence around the outside. Our, our rooms are white walls, nothing on them. Like, and you're just like, oh, cool. So we would go out and buy an Xbox or we'd bring an Xbox with us and we'd go out and get a TV. We'd just have like two or, three TV, two or three TVs next to each other and we'd just sit there and game. I mean... Any way to conserve energy, any way to be able to turn it off, right? Like I think, you know, it's that fine, less, that fine line between passion and obsession. Because like if you obsess too much, then you just, you have to turn it off. You need, to, you need some form of escape. And for me, video games is awesome because, I mean, I just got to talk trash. <laughs> but I had to stop using the headset. <laughs> that was not good. Um, so kind of switching gears a little bit um, with this last student question, what has been the positive and negatives of opening up about mental health? I will, I'll start with the, the negatives, and I don't think there is any, um, because if there are, I don't care, period. Um, the positives, um, personally, I feel there's a weight lifted off my shoulder. You know, for me, I've... Going through what I've gone through personally, I feel like one by one I've lifted weights out of the backpack on my back, and I feel like I'm standing taller. And I feel like the more that I open up or the more I feel like me or the more somebody shares a story with me, we're changing how people look at mental health. And five years ago, there wasn't a single human being that wanted to talk about it. You just wanted to shove it under the rug. No, let's take the Band-Aid off. Let's talk about it. Let's get through it together. It's the only way we're going to. So, um, yeah, I mean, like, that's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, can you talk about the Michael Phelps Foundation and what motivates you to do that work? Um, I was with a, uh, an old sponsor, and they gave me a million-dollar bonus when I won eight gold medals, uh, and I instantly started my foundation. Um, because, again, I, I wanted to change somebody's lives. I wanted, to give, I wanted to give them the same opportunity that I had growing up people to believe in you, a path, somewhere to go. Um, so for me, being able to teach the importance of healthy, healthy and active lifestyles, water safety. Um, water safety is the second highest cause of death for children under the age of 14. And I think it's behind car crashes. Um, and as a dad of three, even though I'm me, that scares me. Um, so teaching water safety, again, that's how I learned to swim. That's how this whole thing started. Um, so that's a big part of who I am. Uh, and the next component that we added is mental health. Um, when I spent 45 days in treatment, um, that's when I kind of learned really about the eight basic emotions um, and kind of when they arise, what to do with them. Understanding it's okay, it's okay to talk about them, write them down. Um, you know, for me, I would compartmentalize with the best. And I think I could have won a few more gold medals at that but it also caused me way more stress than I ever needed. 
Um, so for me, just going through those little things, I think, yeah. Sorry, I just, I don't really finish sentences. I feel like I want to go on forever and ever and ever and ever. And I, I feel like I just, I'm just going to stop. Well, lucky for you, this next round of questions A is lightning called. round. Yes. Is it? It's a lightning round. Yes. So, yes. quick, fast questions and answers. You ready? Yep. All right. Favorite movie of all time? Tommy Boy. Favorite TV show? I don't even know. Um, it's a lie. Uh, I don't know if I have one. I love The Wire. Um, I mean, I'm from Baltimore, so, but I mean, I lived down the street from where all of that took place. Um, yeah, I'll just leave there. Yeah. All right. Favorite. And I don't have time for any more shows Ooh. now. <laughs> favorite book of all time? Uh, the Power of Now. Favorite Eckhart Tolle. Oh, sorry. Go sorry, no, if y'all, if y'all haven't read or listened to it, his voice is incredible. Uh, it's so soothing. So if you like listening to books, I... I recommend it. I've probably listened to it about 10 times, uh, and I pick up something different every time. And that's one thing that I'm trying to do the most, most, most out of my everyday life is living in the now, because that's what my kids do. They do it so well, and I'm trying to do that as hard as I, it's, it's challenging, but read the book. It's, it's an incredible book. Can you repeat the title one more time? Power of Now, power. The Power of Now. Do you have a favorite food that you cook? Uh, I mean, anything I make, I think it's good. <laughs> uh, my family's choice. Um, I guess chicken parm is something that, that everyone loves. Um, I make homemade chicken tenders with certain kind of potato chips, which everyone the boys want, or goldfish or something fun. Um, but it's always just, we, you know, for me, for, for us in the house, we, sorry, I have a story for everything, see? Uh, <laughs> I, the, the one thing I want as a family is I, I want to eat together every single night. That was one thing I never had growing up as a kid. And I love it. And every single night our kids eat what we eat. So there are times like if we go out to eat and we want sushi, our kids will order sushi and they just plow through sushi. It is wild. <laughs> I watched my three-year-old the other day, a four-year-old, pass through. like he, he hammered like 10 pieces of salmon sashimi. I'm like, dude, he pounded a whole fish. Like, it's insane. <laughs> It's mind-blowing, but... <laughs> well, staying on the topic of food, do you have a favorite food from your childhood? No, because eating was a full-time job. Um, to maintain a weight, I was constantly I was shoving food into my mouth. So I would say at the height of my career, I was probably eating eight to 10,000 calories a day. Um, it was nonstop eating, but I was swimming... If I'm swimming 100,000 meters a week, I can fluctuate between five and 10 pounds, and that's not water weight. So, um, yeah, I was just, yeah. So, no, it became a full time job. So, now I'm back then, it's like carnation instant breakfast and power bars, and like, no. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. Uh, favorite drink on a hot summer day? Cold water. I mean, <laughs> I, I like cold water. Like, I'm a big cold water guy, so I don't know. I live in the desert. And that was your reminder to drink some water, everyone. The best cup of coffee you've ever had. A buddy of ours just sent us a machine called a Jura, and it makes the, oh, I mean, I, I didn't know what I was missing out on. <laughs> this thing is unbelievable. Um, but I, I mean, I only drink a cup or two a day. I, I was drinking, when I was swimming, I was drinking two quad shot Americanos every day. Um, so it's, I only have a cup of coffee and probably a double shot now. The kids keep me going. <laughs> All right, best dessert that you've ever eaten. I'm just, I'm, I guess I'm boring. Like I always want a big, like a soft cookie. Like I'm a sucker for soft cookies. Um, like a brownie sundae. Like my wife made an amazing carrot cake last night. My coach's birthday was yesterday. My old coach's birthday. So um, yeah, that was really good. I'm a sweets guy um, all the time. I always have been. Frozen Reese's is probably my favorite go-to. I agree. They're I so, agree with that. But the big cups, the big cups or the holiday version, the peanut butter to chocolate ratio is way, way better. <laughs> well, uh, favorite junk food. 
I answered that. <laughs> Favorite pizza toppings? Probably just a boring pepperoni. That's what my kids are obsessed with. Um, they just started getting into uh, pep or, um, pineapple, pineapple and pepperoni. So the Hawaiian, that, we were just in Hawaii for spring break, so they, they found a new, a new flavor. Some people are triggered with the pineapple on the pizza. <laughs> Um, it's so good. It is good. I, I like it. I'm on that team. But uh, the one splurge grocery item that you have not yet splurged on, but you're always eyeing it. You're like, I want that, but you never get it. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Um, yeah. I could have a story, but obviously, but now we'll go to the next one. <laughs> Favorite dinner your mom made? Mom, mom, didn't, mom didn't cook much. Um, I, my mom was on a very, uh, very busy schedule. Um, she was an educator. Um, she was a principal, a teacher, uh, and now works at the Board of Education. So she was always nonstop. Um, and we always joked that cooking wasn't her forte. But if that was the one thing that she was really bad at, it's OK. Um, she always jokes about it. It's not for me. Um, but we honestly, we would eat out a lot. Um, I would have friends who were taking me home from, from practice. And again, back to the routine, eating 30 minutes after you work out. It's so important to be able to replenish, as we all know, the athletes. How come nobody's shaking their heads? Come on, guys. Um, so yeah, it was just so easy for us to pick up something on the way home. Favorite ice cream ever and from where? I mean, ben and Jerry's flavors are always pretty good. Uh, I'm a sucker for peanut butter, cookie dough, brownies, anything of that. And so they have a, a large variety of flavors that contain all of that. So, Favorite color? Blue. The coolest? Water, right? Everything's around water. <laughs> huh. My kids call me Aquaman, too. It's crazy. They actually <laughs> really do. My, my oldest does. It's funny. <laughs> the coolest natural wonder that you've ever seen? Um, <clears throat> I flew over the Northern Lights. Uh, it was so incredible. Um, I was flying to, I don't know where I was going, mid, uh, somewhere in the Middle East. Um, and we had to stop to refuel in Iceland. We literally flew, and I'm like, what is that? It's like these neon green lights. It was so cool. Um, something I want to experience again. Um, I've been around the Barrier Reef, but I wasn't in, like swimming with it, um, so that doesn't count. And I guess I've seen um, the Rio, Rio de Janeiro Harbor, so a few. But there's a couple more on the list I want to get to. I haven't gotten to all states yet, so I got a lot, lot of things to, uh, a lot of things to do before I die. <laughs> and the best road trip that you've ever taken, where and with whom? <laughs> I've only taken one road trip, and it was uh, across country. Um, my wife and I packed up. I used to live in Baltimore, and um, my wife and I packed up in the middle of the night. We were leaving, but we left in the middle. Of, we, we left in the middle of the night to drive to Arizona, um, and I think that was before. Yeah, it was. It was before I uh, proposed to her, and I just said, if we can make it across country, with like I mean, we didn't. We listened to books on tape, like that's we like you know. There's no radio. Like we just we wanted to use our minds and talk and. I was like, if we, can, if we can do that, we can do anything. And you know, for me, I'll say, my wife and I have been through a ton, um, publicly and privately, and there is not another person on this planet that could help me try to become my authentic self besides her. Um, so I'm very fortunate that I've met her, um, and we made it <clears throat> on that cross-country trip. <laughs> I actually want to... I actually went a cross country trip too, like um, on the road. It was a very interesting time. So props yeah. to people who do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have one last question for you to close out the night. When you think of success, what is some advice you could give to college students, just like everyone here, that are pursuing their goals? <clears throat> I mean, try not try not to obsess over everything being as perfectly as you have it in your head. I hope this makes sense because 
for me, I'm learning that now. And I can create stories in my head, and it's not good. You know, so just understand that not everything's going to be perfect. You're going to have bumps. You're going to have hard times. I want every single one of you to ask for help when you need it. Please. 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 I was afraid for a long time. A long time. Because I didn't want to hear somebody say no. But then I understood maybe that's all they could do at that point. Right? If you ask somebody for help and they can't help you, that doesn't mean no forever. It just means that they don't have space for you at that very moment. Right? It's nothing against you. You know? And I would say literally <laughs> dare to dream as big as you possibly can. Like baby steps. Like I, I, I mean, yeah, it's baby steps. Like it, all of the, everything that I've said today, um, I mean, I guess I'll leave it. I'll leave it at this. I have this thing called whiteboard. A friend of mine just is teaching me this, and I journal a ton. <clears throat> but if you take a whiteboard and you write a thousand things on there, some of them are going to stick, and some of them you're going to erase. Right? Some of them will fit for you. Some of them won't. So get everything out on a piece of paper so you see it. Things might change past might change. But as long as you're giving your everything, you're putting your heart and soul into it, you can accomplish literally everything. I had people my whole entire life tell me that wasn't possible. I had a sixth grade teacher tell me that I wasn't, go I wasn't going to amount to anything because I couldn't sit still. And I was like, oh, okay, so yeah, thanks. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like it, it, they're ups and downs, but always believe in yourself. And never, and I'll say one other thing, take the word can't out of your vocabulary, C-A-N-T, out. I say it too much, and that was something that throughout my career, my coach took out of my vocabulary. Because you say you can't do something, guess what, move on. You made that decision up for yourself. It's a negative word. Positive, little small steps. That's it. It's not rocket science. It's really not. Dream big. I mean, this is awesome. I mean, I, I feel like I'm like more excited, like nervous being up up here. Like I, I can't sit still. Like I've, I want to give you guys so much. Um, I'm sweating like crazy. I'm super excited. Um, but this has been awesome. I, I honestly can't thank you guys enough for for having me and for thinking about me. Um, yeah, ask for help. We can't do it alone. That's a fact. We can't do it alone. I will say it there. I tried to do things by myself. Together, we can make anything happen, right? Michael, thank you so much. We're going to um, ask a couple folks, maybe they want to ask Michael a question. Just raise your hand. Come see me. Come see me. No sensitive subjects. I'll turn them down. <laughs> right. Hi, Michael. Hi. Um, this is just like a dream come true to even talk to you. So Thank you. my name's Leah. Um, but my question is, when you have anxiety or those dark times, how, what do you do to ease yourself out of that and get into the present? It's different for every. Um, I guess the biggest thing is self care. Um, you know, so for me, in a dark day, what it might look like, um, maybe I I spend more time by myself, and the kids are like, "What's going on with Daddy? Daddy's taking some time." So for me, I, I escape, and I want peace and quiet. Um, I go and jump in the swimming pool. Um, I kind of make the joke like uh, there's a Snickers commercial, you know, like you take a bite of Snickers and you feel like a different person. <laughs> for me, it's kind of the same joke for, sw for swimming or working out. Like if I just jump into the pool and swim five laps, I'm like, oh, whoa, that's a different place. Like I feel like a new person. Um, but I think it, it, it's trying to get out everything that you have inside instead of holding on to it. I think for me, that's the one biggest thing that I, I, I can say helped me the most. Um, again, that weight that I was carrying on my back and in that backpack, I mean, it's just going like this. And I hated it. 
Um, I hope that, I don't know if that answers anything. Um, but I think, yeah, just self-care. Self-care is something that, that we, it's easy to forget, right? We get, we get into the process of everyday life, and it's something that's simple to shove off to the side because there's all of these other things. But you can't do all of those other things well if you're not taking care of yourself, right? So I think that's one thing. We all deserve to take care of ourselves. Thank you. Sure. Next, I see some hands. Hi, Michael. I'm Hi. Allison. And my question for you is, whenever you're feeling down or when you want to get energized and hype, like, what's your hype song? What's the song that really gets you going? <laughs> hmm. Gosh. What did somebody just, somebody just passed me a Juicy J song the other day. But it, just, it had my name in it. That's why I was kind of loving it. But it, it, was, it, it, was, it was pretty, like, just the beat for it, for me, was incredible. Um, because for me, I, I think that's the biggest thing, it's beats. Um, and it, it can be country, it can be hip hop, it can be techno. Um, you know, I've, I've walked out to Eric Church, Steve Aoki, and Lil Wayne, right? So there's all of these <laughs> wide variety of people in there. So, um, yeah, I don't know, it's, there's not one song. Um, my wife and I lift together three days a week, and she's, I don't think she's a fan of the music that I play every day, because <laughs> it's usually hip hop when I'm in the gym. Cool. All right. Well, hi. It's nice to meet you, Michael. This is like the best day to listen to you. Thank talk. you. Um, <clears throat> if you have time later, do you think you can come swim at our pool? I'll wear lifeguards here. <laughs> like, I, think I don't have my suit. Idea. I don't have my suit. Uh, I have one for you. I think you can. <laughs> but I can only wear my. You suit. have an open invitation. <laughs> All right. Okay. Next time I'm back here. Thank <laughs> you. Last question. Last question here. Okay, sir. Come up. Come over to me. Hi, how's it going? I'm Vince. Uh, thank you for coming out. Um, so I actually did have a question. So like with your level of success, do you think that there's any type of correlation between like how hard you had to strive to get to where you got and kind of the negative feelings? Like, mm -hmm. do you think those play a part? Um, like, yeah. Hand? Um, you know, I think, uh, I guess, when I watched The Last Dance with Michael Jordan, right, and how he created those stories in his head for any outcome, right, I basically did the same exact thing. And yeah, it probably took a toll on me. Um, you know, using the anger and frustration that I had about not having a father and not talking about it for a long time, that was probably motivation for me. I look back now, and I think the only thing I think about is, what if I took care of my mental health like I took care of my physical health? Because if I did it back then, oh my gosh. I might have 30 gold medals. You know what I mean? So like, I, I just feel like, I feel like if, if, if we are doing that as humans every single day, we're superhuman. We're, we're these superpowers, you know, we, we, we gain these superpowers, we become Superman or Aquaman or whoever you want to be, right? Like, and that's how I approach it, whether it's the good, the bad, or the ugly, because of what I went through in the past, right? Like, yeah, it was probably, it, it was probably extra motivation for me to go through the struggles that I did with my dad or not having my dad around, but probably how I approached it wasn't healthy and how I... I mean, I would attack myself, not in like a harmful way. I would just say things to myself. Um, and this is, you know, I, I've learned so much through this process, whether it was in treatment or with my therapist or what, however it was. But again, for me, every single day, if I'm not practicing my mental health and my physical health, then I'm not taking that step forward. I'm not getting that at least 10, 20, 50 percent out of that day. So that's something that for me, no matter how that looks, no matter what it looks like, I, I, I have to do it. Um, so I, I would urge every one of you, do those two things. Pay attention to your medical, mental and physical health. If we're not, we're not giving ourselves the best chance. I want to be my best authentic self. And the only way I can do that is trying to figure out those two things, trying to figure out how I work. Thank you, Michael, so much for sharing your journey. Everyone give him a hand. Oh, my God.
So Michael, there's so many, there's so many people here. What we're gonna do is we're going to have you stand here, stand here as the statuesque model. And everyone, you all are gonna stand up and take your selfie from your seat with Michael. So Michael's gonna stand up here and everybody turn around and do your selfie. Stand up. Really? Michael's right here. <laughs> Okay, no, don't crowd the, we're not going on the stage, sorry. So get to your, stay where you are. Thank you. Michael, and you can just do, wave to the right, wave to the left. <laughs> Take your pictures, everyone. Take your pictures, so cool. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael.